Arctic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. Many of you may know that biodiversity refers to all of the different kinds of organisms within a given area, including the plants, animals, fungi, and all other living things. All species are interconnected. Coming up on May 22nd is the International Day for Biological Diversity, and at Explorer Classroom, we're celebrating all month long. We've got our National Geographic Explorers joining us throughout the month to talk about the ecosystems they love and what we can do to help protect our planet's biodiversity. So I'm really excited to have Aaron Pomerantz joining us today. He's a National Geographic grantee and an avid science communicator. His motto is that the coolest discoveries are the ones you make. So his research out in the field looks at butterfly wings, their patterns, as well as their colors. He's also pioneered some pretty cool technologies to do his field work in the rainforest, such as origami-based portable microscopes. So Aaron, before we let you take over, I'm gonna share my screen because we like to use MapMaker or National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive just to kind of get a feel for where everybody is here. So um, you're gonna see my screen pop up in just a moment. There we go. And let's take a look. So if we look over here, you can see I'm here just outside of Guelph, Ontario. And as we pull out a little bit more, we can start to see some of the classrooms. We've got classrooms joining us in Markham and Leamington. We've got a classroom joining us in Ohio today. And as we back up a little further, San Antonio, Texas, we've got a couple of classrooms joining us in California. So Benicia and Almada. We also have that Red X down there. That's Aaron joining us from Berkeley. And if we go out nice and wide, we're gonna jump north to Anchorage, Alaska, where we have a final classroom joining us. And if we pull out one more time with the map, we're gonna take a look at a couple of field sites that Aaron might talk about today. So you can see the microscope, or not the microscopes, the magnifying glasses here on Ecuador, as well as Peru. And that's two areas uh, where Aaron does his work in the field. So I think that's enough for me, Aaron. You've got the good stuff, so I'm gonna let you come and take over. All right, thank you very much, Joe. So um, thanks for the introduction, and um, it's really a pleasure to uh, be speaking with all of you from all over today. I think it's such a cool time um, to be a, a scientist, a biologist, um, to be involved with technology and uh, studying biodiversity like Joe mentioned today. So um, a little bit about me, my name is Aaron Pomerantz, and uh, currently I'm in a PhD program, program at UC Berkeley. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and I love the warm weather. Um, I was really lucky that my parents were into uh, biodiversity and my mom was an avid gardener. So I grew up surrounded by lots of flowers and lots of insects and animals. So I think this really helped to foster the sort of love of nature and trying to understand it. And so um, some of the work that I do now as a PhD student, um, as Joe mentioned, is studying butterfly wing patterns um, and also using new technology today to go out into places like the rainforest and use these new tools out in the field. So these are kind of these two little stories that I would like to share with you today. And please let me know if you have lots and lots of questions at the end. So what I'll do is I'll um, pull up the screen share and I have a few slides to show you. So let's go ahead and do a screen share. And got this PowerPoint. So Joe, are we looking okay on that? We got you full screen. All right, fantastic. Okay, so the title of this first part is just called The Places You'll Go With a Lab in Your Backpack. So let's start out um, this journey. If we just imagine um, we're going to go down into the Peruvian Amazon, as Joe showed on that map. And so to start off this journey, you can imagine we would hop on a plane. And after a flight down to South America, you would find yourself start to flying over all this jungle. And so here's a drone's eye view and aerial landscape. When we get into this forest of green, it's this beautiful habitat when we get into the Amazon rainforest. And in order to get out there even further, you need to start traveling by boat. So we'll go for about eight or nine hours sometimes, just deep down the river. Here we are on the boat, um, just getting into the middle of nowhere. And this is fantastic because along the way, you can see really beautiful animals like macaws and parrots, a really beautiful landscape as you get into the rainforest. You can see lots of primates. And if you're really lucky, like on the last trip in the summer, you might see something like a jaguar. So this is a wild male jaguar who's about to pop out of the river. And he's scampering away. He doesn't really like our boat, but he'll turn around and give us a nice wink. <laughs> and of course, there are lots and lots of phenomenal insects out there, like some of the butterflies that I like to study. And so a lot of people ask, um, well, when you get out there, what's it like doing fieldwork? 
So here's um, a little bit of footage just showing what it might be like walking through the rainforest, um, being a field biologist. So you might imagine you get very sweaty, you throw on your rain, rain boots. Um, I'll take my camera equipment out and try and do lots of macro photography. And this will allow us to get up really, really close to some of the smaller organisms like insects that we're interested in. And so along the way, you can see really odd things out in the rainforest. And one of the reasons I really love working out there is because it's always very surprising. You never know what you'll find. So check this out. This was on one of the last trips. And this was this little weird mass of insects I saw on a tree. And look at what happens when you blow on them. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this before, but these are called saw flies. And there are actually dozens of these insects right now that are clustered in this little ball. And it's this interesting little defensive behavior that they have, where they sort of wiggle as one. So that was a cool little observation. When I first went out there, I got really interested in these. These are glowing beetle larvae. So they're bioluminescent. They're able to produce light. And you might wonder why they're producing light. And we actually think it's because they're trying to lure in other insect prey, kind of like a light trap. So you can see they have their little jaws, and if something flies in, they'll grab them and pull them into their lair to eat them. I also got really interested in natural history observations. And so this is when you go out and you just try and observe how an organism lives its life out in the rainforest. And so what you're seeing here in these four different panels are a few different shots of a butterfly, and it's actually hanging out with ants on bamboo. So this was really interesting. This was a recent publication that I co-authored with a friend of mine, Phil Torres. And it, this was a very cool life history observation because normally butterflies don't hang out with ants, but this was a new observation. And we also think, interestingly, that if you see those three red circles on the butterfly wing pattern, we think they might be actually mimicking the ants to serve as protection. Um, because a lot of animals will try to actually avoid ants because they can bite and sting. And then a final example of an insect example that I think is really interesting was another discovery that I just sort of stumbled on. So in the bottom right corner, you can see my finger. And on the left, you'll notice an ant, and it's hovering over a caterpillar. And that caterpillar is munching on these odd little yellow protrusions out of a bark. And so what turns out to, to be going on here is that the caterpillar is feeding on these little yellow fruiting flowers, and the ant is protecting it. Um, because the caterpillar has evolved a special type of organ and it's actually secreting sugar for the ant. And then interestingly, when I was filming this, I noticed that there was a butterfly that landed on the tree and it looked like it had this wing pattern that really closely mimicked these plants. And after doing a little bit more DNA work, it actually looks like this could be a new species of butterfly. So these are just a few examples that I like to share because the rainforest is full of discoveries and there's lots that we still have to discover about biodiversity on our planet. But now the problem today is that, um, as some of you may know, we're losing biodiversity and species. And this is due in part to deforestation, um, to habitat loss. Um, and so there is a very large challenge that we face today with trying to preserve biodiversity on our planet. And so these are a few different images. The two on the left are images that a friend of mine, Lucas Bustamante, took during his fieldwork in Ecuador, um, where you can see some of the effects of deforestation and logging. And on the right is a picture um, of some uh, forest uh, deforestation. So part of my work with the National Geographic Society has been to try and figure out if there are ways that we can um, make fieldwork happen faster and more efficiently. And I think one way we can do this is by taking out new technology into the field. And so this is where we get into our first story of, you know, this question of what if you could take your lab with you on the go? And so these are a few different images in the top panel. You see a few different um, pieces of technology that are miniaturized. And so some of these tools allow us to actually go out into the field and decode the DNA of organisms. Um, and all of this can fit inside of your backpack, which I think is really amazing. So a couple examples like uh, Joe showed you earlier on the map, um, some of this fieldwork has taken me to the heart of the rainforest in the Choco in Ecuador, where you see on that little map there. And on the right is basically all of the tools that I needed to do some of these studies in the field. And this image here is showing another location in southeastern Peru. And in that bottom right corner, you can see the Tembopata Research Center, which is a beautiful field site. Um, and I recently, just a few weeks ago, got back um, from a trip. And this was my lab setup where we were able to um, decode DNA rapidly. And this allowed us to identify species 
And I think it's a really, really interesting time where we can use some of this portable technology in the field. So here's a little bit about what the process looks like. Um, you could go out and you could find a plant or maybe an insect that fed on you. Maybe it was like that mosquito in the bottom left corner that um, fed on my blood. Um, but what's really interesting is you could um, use some of this portable technology to um, take out the DNA of some of these, this material, and then you can sequence it. And when you sequence it, you can decode it, and then you can try and figure out what species these are. So in that top right panel, you'll see me spinning. Um, and that is a portable device that we call a centrifuge. And so there's a little bit slow-mo version of it happening. And in the bottom right, you can see um, the DNA that I extracted from some of this plant material. So what you can do next is start to prepare this DNA, and then you can put it on one of these portable DNA sequencers, like you see in that bottom left panel. And what happens then is you generate all of these awesome nucleotides. So as we know, um, DNA is composed of four nucleic acids, A's, T's, G's, and C's. And it's the particular sequence of these DNA sequences that can allow us to tell what certain species are. So for instance, us as humans, we have a particular genetic code, whereas something like a snake or a mosquito or a plant has a slightly different genetic code. And so by reading it, we can tell what the actual biodiversity is. So for example, this was a really beautiful snake that we found out in the field. Um, and maybe if you looked at it, you couldn't quite tell what it was. Um, but if you were able to look at its DNA while you were in the rainforest, then you could actually tell what species it is. And so we were able to do that. And it turns out that it's uh, called a pit viper. Um, Bothriecus is the genus. And so what you see in the middle panel is that we could accurately get a DNA sequence of the snake. And on the right is kind of like constructing a family tree. And this shows us in red what the species name is. So this is um, sort of concluding our first uh, story here with portable um, technology. And for all of you listening right now, I think it's a really fascinating time um, to be a young scientist because technology is getting portable and it's getting um, more cost effective. So I think in the not too distant future, just like we have cell phones in our pockets today that are really powerful tools, um, we can go out and we can rapidly study um, the diversity around us by looking at its DNA in real time. So I have part two of our story that we'll get into for the next 10 minutes. And this involves how butterflies create color. And so many of us have probably seen butterflies out in the field um, or outdoors, um, and they're really beautiful insects. And so um, they can create all sorts of colors from blues to oranges um, to even transparent species. And so um, this is what I'm really interested in as a PhD student now, is trying to understand what is the DNA, um, what's the actual genetic code that produces all of these amazing different colors. And so if you've actually ever looked at a butterfly up really, really close on a microscope, you might notice that its wings are actually covered in these little scales. So here you can see that um, if you zoom in really close on that little butterfly eye spot, you'll see it's kind of like pixels on a TV screen, right? So you see some of those scales are orange and some are darker brown and some are even blue. So it's all of these little tiny scales put together that create the amazing patterns that we see on a wing. And then the function itself um, for color can have many different roles in a butterfly or moss life. So for instance, color can help with uh, camouflage. So for instance, on the left, we see a butterfly that looks kind of like a dead leaf so that it might get missed by a hungry bird. In the middle is a beautiful morpho butterfly. So maybe it's flashy blue can serve as a distraction. And on the right is a butterfly called a heliconius. And it has a very bright orange coloration because the butterfly is actually poisonous. So it's actually um, displaying this, this certain color to a bird saying like, hey, I'm poisonous, you shouldn't eat me. Now, when we dig down a little bit into the details of what color actually is, it's actually really fascinating how animals produce their colors that we see. So for instance, in the top, you can see a spectrum of the color wheel that we've probably seen in classrooms before. And each color is um, represented by a different uh, wavelength. And so I have in the middle, you can see pigment versus structural color. And these are two primary different ways that animals can actually go about making the different types of wavelengths that we see in nature. So for instance, may, many of us may be familiar with pigments. Um, so for instance, your clothing is a certain color because of a pigment that's in it. Um, and our skin is a certain color because we make um, certain pigments as well. However, there's another way you can produce color, and this is called structure. And so um, as a little demonstration with this, 
we can look a little bit close at some of these butterfly wing scales. So you see in, a little bit closer in this species, there are lots of browns and oranges and yellows. So there are different genes that create different pigments. However, if we look really close at say like one of these morpho butterflies, that's this beautiful iridescent blue, um, there's actually no blue pigment at all. It's actually just physics interacting with the wing in a particular way. And so we can um, actually look at the physics of this to see how butterflies make their structural color. And so in, uh, in nature, maybe you've seen things like rainbows or light hitting a prism. And this is actually um, a, a type of structural coloration. So white light will come in and it can bend into particular wavelengths. And what's really fascinating is that um, animals like butterflies can produce color this way as well. So as a little demonstration of this, you can actually take a butterfly wing, say like one of these blue morpho wings, and if you put a little droplet of, um, of ethanol or alcohol on the wing, check out what happens. Okay. So maybe you can see as the alcohol droplet goes on the wing, it changed to green. But then as it starts to dry off, it shifts back to blue again. So this is happening as an example of structural color because that drop of alcohol is interacting with what are called little nanostructures on those scales. And so they're actually shifting the wavelength of light from blue back to green. And so part of what we're interested in in our lab is trying to figure out how butterflies actually create these colors on their scales. And so you might notice that there are all sorts of colors from like oranges to blues to browns. And one way we can try and investigate this further is trying to figure out what goes on inside of the pupa. So as some of you may have seen before, uh, um, maybe you've uh, raised a caterpillar before or seen the life process, um, but butterflies start out their life as these chubby little caterpillars that like to go around and eat plants, right? Um, and then they'll form a chrysalis. And so um, it's during that chrysalis stage that they kind of break down and become kind of like a soup almost. And then they'll turn into a butterfly slowly and then they'll come out. And so one of the tricky things is that we can't actually look into the pupa to see what's going on. Um, until recently, um, our lab developed a technique where we can actually look into the wings of a pupa. So this is a video that we're, uh, that'll play in a moment. And you can actually watch the development of a butterfly wing. And so here you'll notice that we have a pupa and that these are the eyes to the right and it's got its little antenna. Um, and this is the wing right here. And so as I hit the play button, you can start to see the wing developing. And so this was a time lapse that I put underneath a microscope. And you might notice that the wing starts to change and it's starting to grow a little bit. And it's starting to change color. It looks like some of those scales have started to form. And what's really cool is you can actually start to see some of the colors come in. And just a little bit before the butterfly comes out, you see the flash of colors. So it's just turned on those genes to make those pigments. And so this is a really fun study where we can start to investigate further how butterflies actually make the colors that we see in nature. And so these are um, two sort of different stories that I've told you today in collaboration with many, um, many awesome friends and colleagues, um, all the way from Berkeley um, and support from National Geographic um, and some of the companies that have created some of these portable technologies. And so um, in the top corner, you see um, some of my colleagues on a trip to Ecuador. Um, and I'll pull the screen back down and show you just in the last couple of minutes before answering some questions. Let's see, stop sharing. Okay, and so um, in the lab, you might notice behind me as well, I have um, on the TV screen one of those butterfly wings. And so if you zoom in really, really close, let's see there. So I've just zoomed in a little bit more on one of these butterfly wings, and you can see the mosaic of some of those scales taking place. And um, what I'm trying to do now is combine both the lab work and the field work to understand how animals create color and how some of these uh, tools, like what I showed you earlier, um, can help us decode the DNA. And so that was a little bit of you know, a crash course on very two different stories. Um, but I would love to take any questions that you have because I think it's a very exciting time to be a young scientist. Like for any of you watching, I think it's just amazing that some of these tools are becoming cheaper and more portable. Um, and there's a lot left to discover. Um, basic things of like how animals create color, um, all the way to what organisms um, are there in the rainforest. So just as a, a little example as well, we've discovered 
you know, maybe like 10,000 different mammal species. But for instance, when it comes to insects, there are around 2 million described species so far. And this represents maybe just about 10% of what's actually out there. So I guess overall, I'm just trying to say that it's a fantastic time to be uh, a young scientist or at least interested in biology because there are a lot of opportunities to get involved and to make new discoveries. All right, Aaron, that was great. I think uh, you're absolutely right. There's kind of this rumor going around, I think, that hits some students that there's nothing left to explore or discover. And, and as you've shared, that couldn't be further from the truth. There's so much still to do and for us to understand and species and, and the biodiversity you shared with us in the rainforest is just pretty incredible. So it looks like you're doing some great work uh, in the lab. Those time lapses are really cool. All right, before we meet some of our classrooms, uh, any classrooms who are watching online, you can use the YouTube chat sidebar. Send us a message, let us know who you are and where you're watching from, and fire off a couple questions. And a couple classes have already done that. So we have some third graders in Freehold, New Jersey, uh, with Mrs. Reading. They're watching along. Hey, third graders. And then we have also some more third graders in Calgary, Alberta, so here in Canada, with Mrs. Bifford. So big shout out to those third graders, and I'm looking forward to some of your questions. But let's meet one of our first live classrooms. Let's see, let's go to Mrs. Gonzalez's class first. They're fourth graders, they're in San Antonio, Texas. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, fourth graders? Hey. Hey, hello. 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 All right, does someone have a question? Yeah. Tina, why don't you come up to the camera? Okay, fine. Wait a minute. Come on. How many species of butterflies are there? Oh, that's a great question. How many species of butterflies are there? Um, so there are several thousand, um, but in fact, if you combine all butterflies and moths, there are over 200,000 species in total. So many of those have left to be discovered. Um, many of them are in the Amazon rainforest. And so, um, for instance, the one butterfly that I showed earlier that had the little yellow um, wing spot, um, I think that is potentially a new species. And the way you can try and tell if it's a new species is by looking at its morphological traits, like its physical traits. And you can also look at its DNA. And so by combining both, you can try and figure out, you know, it, what species is it and is it a new species? All right, great question to get us started. And I'm gonna swing through each classroom once and then we'll see how our time's looking. We might open it up for some more questions as well. So let's see, let's jump to another fourth grade classroom. They're in Benicia, California with uh, Mrs. Shelton. Just give me a moment, I'll turn your microphone on. Hello, Hello. There. Say hi. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Say, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Eric, and my question is, have you ever had to kill a butterfly to study it? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, the answer is yes. Sometimes the scientists, um, especially when you're trying to study DNA, um, you do have to kill some, some of the organisms that you study. And so it's a really good question of, you know, uh, is it ethical to kill a butterfly? And um, for better or worse, sometimes you have to do that in order to study it. Um, so it's a good question. Some of them we raise in the lab, so it's not like we take them out of the environment. But uh, yes, it is necessary sometimes. All right, thanks for that great question. Let's see, let's go to, um, actually before we go to the next class, uh, Mrs. Carton's class, just a reminder, in Anchorage, Alaska, if you send in your message via the blue chat sidebar, I'll keep an eye out uh, for some of your questions. I know the microphone's acting up a bit today. But uh, while we wait for that, let's go to a grade five classroom in Alameda, California. And they're with Mrs. Booth. Let's unmute their microphone for them. Hey, grade fives. Why do you do what you do? Sorry, could you say the question again? Why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think I do what I do because I grew up, um, just when I was young like you guys, I really loved trying to understand the natural world around me. 
And I've just been trying to pursue that ever since. And I feel um, really fortunate to get to work with organizations like the National Geographic Society and at universities, um, because it allows me to keep studying the organisms that I love to study and try and make new discoveries. So to me, the most important thing is the unknown. And I really like trying to go out and figure out something new. So that's what motivates me. So checking our YouTube uh, viewers, we have a question that just came in from Mrs. Reading's grade threes in New Jersey. And they just told me that they're studying ways to help rainforest ecosystems and the human impact uh, on those biomes. So they're wondering what human impact uh, is there on butterfly populations? Oh, that's a really good question. So human impacts, um, like we know, we've um, uh, caused you know, a lot of deforestation. We've changed climate in certain ways. And this affects many organisms, um, from an elephant all the way to a butterfly. And so certainly there are some populations of butterflies that we've seen become impacted. For instance, when we introduce um, cattle, we know we've introduced um, new types of plants as well. And this can actually shift butterfly host plants. There was an interesting story that came out last week that showed that a butterfly had actually jumped to a different host plant when we brought it in. Um, and then when the cattle went away, the plant went away as well. And then the butterfly population crashed. So there are certain conservation efforts, um, especially with um, other butterflies that are very charismatic, like monarch butterflies. So we know their populations are going down as well. And this might be due to agriculture and pesticide use. So I think it's very important, like you said, um, to take into consideration all types of different organisms, including butterflies, when it comes to management programs and trying to understand how we can best conserve their populations. Great question from our class in New Jersey. And they also wanted me to tell you they have butterflies in their classroom. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's go to a 7-8 class. They're in Markham, Ontario, so not too far from me. Uh, Mrs. Jane's grade 7-8. And your microphone will be on now. Hey, 7-8. <laughs> Um, by far, where has your favorite place to study? Oh, my favorite place to study. I think um, when, when I was um, finishing a master's degree at the University of Florida, I actually joined a friend on a trip to Peru. And we were going out um, to a place called the Tembopata Research Center. Um, so I showed one picture during the presentation. And I really love it there. Um, it's very far away, so you know you have to jump on a flight and travel for hours and hours and hours. Um, but then you're in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. And so that has been one of my favorite places to go because it's very remote um, and there's tons of amazing plants and animals out there. And it's a really beautiful place. So there's lots of other fun places I've been to and jungly places, but I think by far um, in the Peruvian Amazon, it's really beautiful. Our group joining us in Anchorage, Alaska. I don't think they can use the chat sidebar, but they just held a question up to the screen for me. And they're wondering about what butterflies eat and does it impact their color? Oh, that's a really good question. So butterflies um, can eat lots of, different, um, lots of different things, actually. So primarily, they eat plants, um, but they can be very specific of what type of plant they want to eat. And certainly we know that with caterpillars, they can change colors depending on what type of plant or food you give them. So, um, and they can even change color over time. So when it comes to the butterfly color itself, I don't think we actually know if its food plant affects its color, but that's a really good question. So it might at the butterfly stage, but I know certainly it can affect what color the caterpillar is. Great question, uh, Anchorage. Keep them coming. I'll keep my eye on your screen for if there's another written question. We're going to take a little trip uh, down the 401 from where I am to Leamington. And we have a grade four class joining us with Mrs. Reeb. And let me just turn their microphone on. Hello. How are we doing, Leamington? Hi. Hi. My question is. Why do you call a butterfly a butterfly? Why do you call a butterfly a butterfly? Hmm, it's a good question. Well, let me back up a second. We know um, we call them uh, Lepidoptera um, in particular because um, that's, that's the order. And so uh, the, the Latin root that we use for Lepidoptera means scale and wing. So um, if you ever see a butterfly or a moth, you could also say that they're in the order Lepidoptera. 
Um, but why it's actually called a butterfly, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> All right. Well, that can be a little research task for the classrooms as well. If you jump onto Google and it'll give you something to track down. Uh, okay. And our final live classroom, who we haven't visited quite yet, they're joining us from Dayton. Uh, I believe it's in Ohio. And then they're with Mr. Ince. They're grade 10s and 11. So let me turn their microphone on. Hello. There we go. Hey. Hi. Hey there. All right. Um, I was wondering, what did finding a butterfly is like the center finding how they make their pigment be similar to how scientists find how a human makes their pigment? Like, wouldn't that be like a similar kind of process? Um, it's a question one more time. Do you come to the question? I was wondering if, uh, Finding how a butterfly makes their pigment, wouldn't that be similar to how a scientist find, would find how a human makes hair pigment? Wouldn't that be like a similar kind of process? Absolutely. So for instance, you know, melanin in our hair, we all have, um, many of you on the screen have dark colored hair, which is a, a, a pigment molecule um, that's melanin, right? And so butterflies actually do use the same kind of melanin pigmentation to produce those darker colors. Um, but they also use additional pigments. So for instance, like oranges and reds are produced by what are called omochromes. Um, and then the blues and greens that we see are usually from those structural colors. And so I don't know if any of you in the room have like green eyes like I do, but um, for instance, I'm not making a green pigment. Um, it's actually just light is interacting with my eye, the structures on my eye, and that produces a green wavelength. So to answer your question, yes, there are certainly um, really important parallels that we could learn from all sorts of animals by learning some, some of those fundamental genes that make pigments or those structures. Another great question, good job. So just looking uh, online, we have a group of grade twos with Mrs. Hodges and they're watching us uh, live. So don't forget to let me know where you guys are watching from. And they're studying pollinators, so bees and butterflies, and they learn that the bee populations are declining. What's happening with butterfly populations? That's a really good question. So like, like you've probably um, learned about in your classrooms, um, some bee populations like the honeybee Apis mellifera has been in decline. Um, and this may as well be due to um, things like habitat loss, agriculture, pesticides, um, new types of pests that humans bring in. So these are all issues that can impact species like honeybees that we know are very important pollinators for our food crops. And the same goes for butterflies and other insects as well. So this might be um, also some of the things that affects, say, monarch butterflies or other types of butterflies. Um, and so um, it's really important to try and try and take a, a very broad approach to managing, in my opinion. So um, some farmers use, for instance, integrative pest management, where they don't just want to spray a pesticide on a crop. Um, maybe they'll use good insects, which is called biological control. Um, maybe they'll try and use um, better ways to control their, their crops. Um, but I think it's also important too, something that we can all do is plant more native crops as well. So sometimes we live in cities and we get rid of the native plants or if, an, um, or if like farming gets rid of plants. So I think it's important for us, um, and there are organizations that do this, to try and encourage more native types of plants. And so just like you said for honeybees, it's really important for butterflies too to bring back wild flowers and wild native plants. That would be really important for these native populations. Perfect. So I'm just looking at the screen. I see our class in Alaska is putting another one up for us. And they're wondering uh, if that species turns out to be a new butterfly, do you get to name it? And what would you name it? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. If you discover a new species, you know, how do you name it? What do you get to name it? And so normally with a species, the first part of the name is the genus. And the second part is the species name. So for instance, we're um, in the genus Homo as humans and sapiens is our species. And so for the butterfly, this is probably in a genus that's called Terranthina. Um, and the species name, I would have to give it. So I haven't um, really picked a name yet. Um, sometimes you can name it after a family member. Sometimes you can name it after the place it was discovered in. Um, but I haven't quite picked a name for it yet. But um, it's a really good question. I'm trying to um, finish writing that up this summer. Um, but what's also important is uh, collecting more evidence to uh, show that it could potentially be a new species. So as you mentioned earlier, we're using both some of um, its physical features and for DNA um, to show that it might actually be a new type of butterfly. That's a really good question. 
We're getting lots of great questions coming in, uh, including online. And Mrs. Hodges, grade two, is there in Zachary, Louisiana. So glad to have them joining in and watching along with us. I saw Mrs. Shelton's class has another question, so let me turn their microphone on. Um, come here, Cameron. Say hi, guys. Hello again. Hello again. Hello again. Uh, hi, I'm Cameron. And one of my questions is, has anything gone wrong in one of your experiments? Has anything gone wrong in one of my experiments? Uh, all the time. And that's part of the fun thing about being a scientist, is things don't go right all the time. Um, it's sort of a process where you might have you know, a hypothesis, and then you try and test it. And then um, while you do that, it might not work out so well. Um, maybe your experiment doesn't quite work. Maybe a piece of equipment doesn't work. Um, or maybe just your hypothesis turns out to be incorrect. And then you can adjust it accordingly. But that's why the scientific process is really important, because we can test our questions. And a lot of times it doesn't work out, but that's sort of the challenge and the fun of doing science. Is um, It's not that you're necessarily trying to prove that you're right, you're just trying to test a certain hypothesis. And um, things go wrong all the time though, but that's okay. <laughs> all right, I think that's really important is failure is not really a bad thing, especially if you learn from it. So failing can be a good thing. Okay, so let's just swing through a couple more classrooms. So Mrs. Gonzalez's class, your microphone's on again if you guys have another question. Um, Some hands, that's a good sign. Yeah. Hi, my name is Derek, and my question is, what is a butterflies and the moths favorite food? Ah, uh, what's their favorite food when they're butterflies and moths? Um, you know, it's interesting, when, when they're caterpillars, they'll usually just eat plants um, or, or whatever they're munching on as caterpillars. But then when they're adults, they'll usually want to drink something that has nectar in it. So that's why you'll see them visiting flowers. And they're trying to get uh, nectar, which has a lot of sugar in it, and it gives them a lot of energy. Um, so normally, if you see a butterfly, that's why they're visiting flowers, is to get their food. Um, but you know, in the lab, we can also give them Gatorade and other things that have sugar in it. So you can find other types of um, you know, food when they're adults. But it has to be liquid, because they use a proboscis to actually put it in and then suck up um, just some liquids. But something sugary is usually what they're after. Mrs. Booth's class, your microphone's on again if you guys have another question. Oh. What is uh, the most amazing butterfly you've ever seen? And what is the uh, my origami microscope thing that you were- Oh yeah, yeah. good questions. Um, let's see, the most amazing butterfly I've ever seen. Hold on one sec, let me see if I have it right here. I think I do. Aha, okay. So check this out. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, this is a museum specimen, which is why it's on a pin. It's been preserved in the museum for a while now. Um, and this is a species that I'll hold up to the camera and see how it's kind of like a transparent butterfly, right? So you can see its wings here and it's got a little bit of pink on the wing. And so this is a species that's called the blushing phantom. And it's found in South America, and it's kind of like this invisible butterfly. It's really amazing looking. And it's got a little bit of pink on the wing as well. So that's one of the species that, um, that I try to study to try and understand how do you actually make invisible wings, um, which is kind of a fun question. And uh, I think your part two was asking about the origami microscope. And so um, that... That one is um, an invention that came out of Stanford University, where these researchers came up with a way to make a microscope, but it's made out of paper. And so it's called a fold scope. And so maybe some of you are interested in using that, and you could go online, and if you type in fold scope, you'll be able to find that. So it's a cheap, um, uh, in, in the sense that it's a low cost uh, paper microscope, which I think is a really phenomenal tool that any of you could use. All right, let's go back to Leamington. Uh, let me turn your microphone back on. You guys, come on. You guys have another question? All right. We'll swing back. Doesn't look like there's a question ready to go right away. So, 
Let's go to Mr. Uh, Ince's group again, or 10 and 11. So your microphone is on. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, would you allow students who are uh, in college studying like pre-vet or veterinary medicine or biology to do field study with you? Or study oh, yeah. That's an awesome question. So um, typically during my field expeditions, I've just gone um, with either other groups of scientists. But something that we're trying out um, is opening up a two-week classroom where students can come and they can do um, genetics in the field with us. So um, I can send out a link, but this is um, through an organization called fieldprojects.org. And this is something that we're launching our first class this summer, actually, where we have um, several students coming out and we're going to use some of this portable equipment in Peru. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, you can also send me an email as well. Because I think it'll be a really fun opportunity to try and turn these into you know, short courses and potentially lead some of these with National Geographic in the future as well. Good question. Um, let's see. I think we visited our classrooms again. just want to make sure I didn't give miss anybody for a second chance. Um, I can see a question being held up in Alaska. And they're wondering, can any butterflies change their color to better camouflage? That's a really good question. So um, when a butterfly is an adult, um, it's sort of in its final form. So probably we've all studied metamorphosis, where it'll go from a caterpillar, it will grow through different stages called instars, it will turn into a pupa, and then become a butterfly. And so when it's a butterfly, it's actually fully grown, um, and it won't be able to change color at that point in its final life stage. However, butterflies can actually change color um, if they're in a um, caterpillar or pupa stage, in response to the environment. So this is uh, a term that you might see come up um, called uh, plasticity or um, a response to the ecosystem. So for instance, if it's a warm time of year, it might come out as a certain color versus a cold time of year, it might come out as a different time, uh, type of color. So it's a really cool question because yes, a lot of animals are actually capable of modifying their colors, um, but they might do it when they're in earlier life stage and still developing. So that means that they're probably flipping on certain genes in response to the environment. Okay, I think we can squeeze one more in, and I know Mrs. Shelton's class uh, has one more question. Let me turn their mic on. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Presley. And are <laughs> butterfly wings unique like fingerprints? Oh, are they unique like fingerprints? That's a really cool question. So <laughs> butterflies um, have thousands and thousands and maybe even millions of scales on their wings. And yet they're able to you know, produce them in like really, really consistent patterns. So that's something that scientists are really interested in is trying to figure out how you can get the same thing over and over and over again. Um, but I would imagine that there's some uniqueness to how butterflies make their scales. And so probably each one is a little bit different. And so by looking at a pattern, you could probably tell what species it is. And so to answer your question, yes, it's probably unique in that sense where each one is a little bit different, kind of like all of our fingerprints. All right, well, first of all, a huge shout out to our online classrooms. Uh, it was a great group of classrooms joining us in New Jersey, Louisiana, uh, Alberta. So good group of classrooms, great questions. Live classrooms, you guys were awesome. You had some really great questions. And oh, uh, Aaron, before we sign off, or after we sign off, uh, the class in Anchorage, they like to get selfies with the Explorer. So they're all gonna get up after we sign off and get a picture with you. So that sounds you great. stick around for that. Um, everybody online was great. Everybody live, great questions. And Aaron, I think this was perfect for our theme of biodiversity. Your lab's doing some incredible work. Those symbiotic relationships you showed us at the beginning were pretty darn cool. And uh, yeah, I look forward to following along and hopefully hosting you more on Explore Classroom. That sounds great, thank you. All right, well, before we do sign off, I'm gonna turn all the microphones on and we'll give classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you. So nice and loud, here we go, microphones are coming on. Bye. Bye. All right, thanks everyone for hanging out today and we'll see you next time on Explore Classroom.